So we're continuing our study of topic 10, Tanzil and Incarnation. And um, the, uh, the background reading uh, comes from this book here, The Ways of the Christians and the Muslims, and it's chapter 7, which explores more deeply than we can do in the lecture the issues and the challenges that we're looking at. But what we're trying to do is to interpret uh, Jesus as the Son of God to our Muslim friends. And as I said in the previous presentation, uh, I find it very helpful to build upon this Quranic uh, affirmation that Jesus is Kalimatullah, also that he is Ruhullah, meaning the Spirit of God, but particularly when we talk about the incarnation that he is Kalimatullah. But as I said in the previous presentation, we need to be aware that when the Quran says Jesus is Kalimatullah, I don't think it means the same thing that the Bible means when it says Jesus is uh, the Word becoming human. Like I said, the Quran itself explains that this means that God spoke and he is created in the womb of the Virgin miraculously. Yet, having said that, this Kalimatullah statement in the Quran, I believe, is a window through which we can invite our Muslim friends to come and hear now the witness of the gospel as to what it means for Jesus to be Kalimatullah. And so we say, thank you for sharing what Muslims understand, but now come and hear the word of the gospel, which is what I did in the mosque that night, you see. I think one reason they respected what I shared was that I recognized that the Muslim understanding is different, uh, probably. And it, it, it's certainly different than what the biblical New Testament understanding is. So then that opened the door for them to hear. Someone said, well, when you explain Jesus as Son of God in this way, how do Muslims respond? On a couple occasions, I've even had the Imam come and weep on my shoulders as he said, thank you, thank you. I can see that you believe in the oneness of God, you know. And as you've explained it to us, I can see you're not going to go to hell after all. Because see, the Quran says, if you believe that there's many gods or that God has associates, that will take you to hell for sure. And when you say that God had a wife and had a son, if that's what we believe, that'll take you to hell. And so this great sense of relief, oh, praise God, Dawood Shek does not believe that God had a wife and had a son. Oh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. He means that Jesus is kalimatullah. That's what the word, oh, the son, that's, see, such a sense of relief. Now, Jesus, the son of God, means more than the, being the word incarnate. And so that night in the mosque, I pushed out in some other directions as well, which I want to push out with you here as well. Jesus, the Son of God, also means that he had a perfect relationship with God the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. All that the Father wants me to do, I do. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That language speaks of relationship, you see. A precious fellowship and unity of oneness bounded by love. I and the Father are one, you see. And in the mosque I said, let me surprise you tonight. When we believe in Jesus the Messiah, we are invited into God's family and we also become sons and daughters of God. Jesus is the Son, <laughs> you see. But we are also his sons and daughters invited into his family. And that's why as Christians we pray, our Father who art in heaven, which is a prayer Muslims do not utter. But in Christ, adopted into the family of God, we know God is our loving Heavenly Father. So we are tasting some of the perfect unity and fellowship that God and the Son, Jesus, had with one another. You know, absolute unity. We're tasting some of that, not the fullness, but some of it as we say yes to Jesus and we're invited into God's family. And that's why with utmost humility and great joy, I address God as my loving Heavenly Father and thank Him that I am His Son adopted into His family. So that's the other dimension of Jesus as Son of God. And there's a third dimension. Jesus was the perfect servant. In everything and every way, he obeyed God fully, you see. And that's another dimension of Jesus as Son of God. And can you hold on to your chairs? <laughs> There's a fourth dimension, which I want to mention as well. 
Remember when Adam and Eve turned away from God? Remember that when Adam and Eve were created, they were created in God's image? When they turned away from God, that image was spoiled, distorted? In a sense, you could say, as created in God's image, they were sons and daughters of God, created in God's own image, perfect fellowship and relationship with God, but that was distorted and spoiled as they turned away from God. Jesus, as the Son of God, is the restoration of the image of God, the full restoration of the image of God that was spoiled and in many ways lost when Adam and Eve turned away from God. So these are four dimensions of Jesus as Son of God. He is Kalimatullah, the Word of God in human form. You can never separate God from His Word. The Word is the true revelation of who God is. And so when we meet Jesus, we're meeting the one who is God with us. The Word becoming human. It also means father-son relationship. He had a perfect relationship with God the Father. And it means that Jesus is the obedient son, the obedient servant. In everything, in every way, he obeyed God fully. So all of his actions are a perfect reflection of God's will. And finally, he is the recreation of the sonship and daughtership of God that was distorted and spoiled when, when our primal parents, Adam and Eve, turned away from God. Those are three or four different dimensions of Jesus as Son of God. I'll just say, as I explain that to our Muslim friends, there is often a kind of sigh of relief. Praise the Lord. You don't believe in polytheism. This is so wonderful, you see. Now, I wish that immediately they would become Christians. But what I've described is God coming down and meeting with us, getting involved in the yuck and the mess. The Word becomes human and lives among us. Jesus, as the Son, perfect fellowship and relationship with, with God the Father, is the Good Shepherd who goes and looks for the lost in the midst of the storms and battles. He gets involved, you see. All of that reveals a dimension of God's love which astonishes Muslims. Let me give an illustration. I go to um, Indonesia very frequently. And when I get to the Jakarta airport, usually a pastor called the Yesaya Abdi meets me. He's a devout Christian pastor. And um, driving through Jakarta here uh, a couple years ago with him, I said, Yesaya, what is happening here as we're driving through Jakarta reminds me of God in Islam. Meaning that, at every red light, the beggar boys and girls would come and knock on the window. And Yesai would always have a box of 100 rupiah coins in his car. And he'd roll down the window that far, and he would give each of the beggar boys a 100 rupiah coin. Why? Because Yesai is compassionate and merciful, you see. And then he'd roll up his window, and we would continue in our air-conditioned car, to the next stoplight. Again, the knocks on the window, the rolling down of the window, and the contribution of 100 rupiah coins to each of the beggar boys. Sometimes a beggar boy would come with a musical instrument, and he would stand outside the window, <laughs> and so in that case, he would get 200 rupiah. You see? And I said that knocking on the window reminds me of Salat that our Muslim friends do Salat. And then they say, God, be merciful to us. Look, we've done our Salat, and God is merciful. Sometimes they will do extra Salat, like the beggar boy with the eh, eh, eh. And so they will get more mercy, you see, more gifts from God as they do this extra Salat. But we are in an air-conditioned car, and we are in no way affected by those beggar boys and girls at all. Not affected at all. And that's God in Islam. He is merciful and compassionate, but he never comes down to meet us and to get involved in the yuck and suffering and sorrow and sinfulness that we experience as human beings on earth. God transcends all of that in Islam. But I said to Yesaya, in Jesus, God has gotten out of the car, hasn't he? He said, that's right. And he's gone into the streets and alleyways of Jakarta. 
In fact, he runs looking for them. You know, the father in the story of the prodigal son running in a most undignified way. He tucks up his, tucks up his skirt, you know, his long skinny legs sticking out as he runs down the path to get the prodigal son. This is God in Christ. Oh, you beggar boys, come, become my sons and daughters. Welcome to my family. I will adopt you into my home. I love you so much. I'll give you baths. I'll give you clean clothes, abundant food. Welcome to my family. As he runs here and there through the streets of Jakarta, looking for the beggar boys, and they gang up on him, and they beat him, and they kick him, and they spit on him, and they put him on a tree and kill him. What crime has he done? Only that he loves them so much. And in his resurrection, he says, look what you've done to me. Look at the wounds of my body. Seriously, welcome to my family. Become my sons and daughters. And their heart is melted by that love. And they say yes to the invitation and come to the family of God and become adopted into his family. You see, that's the essence of the incarnation. That's the incarnation at its core. And our Muslim friends say, oh, but David, God cannot love that much. He is transcendent. He is sovereign. He never comes down and meets us in our situation. He sends his mercy down. But he himself never gets personally involved. Stay in the car, the air-conditioned car, you see. But in Jesus, God has gotten out of that car, goes into the highways and byways. So this interpretation of Jesus as Son of God that I've tried to describe, it's not just a philosophical discussion. It has to do with the very soul of God, what he's about, how much he loves. And the message of the incarnation is that God so loved us that he has come in Jesus. He sent his Son so we might not perish but have everlasting life. He is the good shepherd who goes into the highways and byways looking for the lost, gets wounded in the storms and the thorns scratch him and he looks, seeking the lost, bringing them to his family, adopting them into his family. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that we proclaim. You know? Or my Muslim friends say, oh, God can't love that much. I say, I beg you, let God be God. Don't put him in a box and say he can't love that much. In the mosque that night, I said, there's something else I want to explain about Jesus as Kalimatullah, the word becoming human. Let's just imagine for a moment that this chair is Jesus. That's an awful illustration, isn't it? But we'll just forgive me. Jesus a chair? No. But let's just imagine that this represents Jesus who is Kalimatullah. Now, when you open, when you open the New Testament, you will find that the first book in the, Old Test in the New Testament is Matthew. So you read Matthew, it is a report, a witness concerning Jesus who is the Word. Then you read on and you come to Mark. And then you read on some more, you come to Luke, and then you come to John. All four of these writers are bearing witness to Jesus who is the Messiah, who is the Son of God, who is the Word among us, incarnation, incarnated among us. Why those four witnesses? See, this is very important because our Muslim friends say, where is the gospel of Jesus the Messiah? You open up the New Testament, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but where is the gospel of Jesus the Messiah? And so, like I said the other day, the assumption is that apparently Jesus took it with him when he went to heaven and it's not even around anymore. And furthermore, you read those Gospels, they're history, they're historical narratives, so much of it. Some of it is the teachings of Jesus, but much of it is what he did, what the disciples did, and so forth, you see. So how can this be the Gospel? Where is the Gospel? And so I said, now why these four witnesses? Ah, it's because Jesus is the Gospel. The Word became human and lived among us. He didn't bring the gospel, brothers and sisters. He is the gospel. And so, God in his providence determined there will be four witnesses concerning this one who is the gospel. Matthew, who writes of the gospel with a strong sense of the kingdom of God. And then there is Mark, 
who was Peter's translator. So Mark's gospel is often referred to as the gospel of Peter. And then there is Luke, writing from this perspective here, who was a medical doctor and who has a great, greatly impressed with Jesus as Son of God, what all of that means. And Luke interviewed many people as he wrote his gospel who were associates with Jesus. I think Luke went and interviewed the Virgin Mary herself. As you read the accounts of the birth, this surely came from Mary, Mary herself, you see. A very careful researcher. And then there is John, who was the closest to Jesus of all the disciples. Each one of these very close associates with Jesus or the disciples of Jesus, who bear witness to this one who is the gospel, who is the word. Why four witnesses? Why not just one witness? Ah, we know the answer to that, don't we? If you go to a court of law, and you have only one witness, the matter will not be established. But four witnesses, the matter is established. And God wanted to be sure that the witness concerning this one who is the Word <laughs> in human form, who is the Gospel incarnate among us, that the witnesses will be adequate, that we can know with confidence the truth of what they're bearing witness to. That's why God planned for four witnesses and not just one. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Now, how did this gospel arrive on planet Earth? Question for you. How did the gospel get here? How did he arrive? How did the gospel get here? Muslims say the Quran came through Muhammad. How did the gospel arrive? The whole, through the power of the Holy Spirit? And what was the Don't medium through whom the gospel arrived? Mary. Oh. Mary. Exactly right, the Virgin Mary. Notice that. It's very important. All Muslims, if they know the Quran, believe that Jesus is born of the Virgin. What's all that about? Ah, it's because the Gospel came through the Virgin. See? Muslims say that the Quran came through Muhammad. But the Gospel did not come through Jesus. The Gospel is Jesus. The Gospel came through Mary, the Virgin Mary. So be careful. When you're comparing Quran and Injil and Jesus and Muhammad and so forth, remember that. <laughs> Jesus does not occupy in the Christian biblical understanding the place that, the, that, that Muhammad occupies in the Muslim understanding. Within the Muslim understanding, the Quran comes to Muhammad. He is the channel through which it comes. But Jesus is not the channel through whom the gospel comes. For he is the gospel. He is the book from heaven. He is the Injil. Rather, it is the Virgin Mary. So in terms of revelation appearing among us, Mary and Muhammad function with some similarity. But not Jesus and Muhammad. So I said in the mosque that night, you say that the Quran came through Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. But the gospel did not come through Jesus. The gospel came through the Virgin Mary, for Jesus is the gospel, you see. He is the good news. And by the way, the Quran says the same thing. The Quran says that Jesus is good news. <laughs> he is the gospel. He is the good news, you see, who came through the Virgin Mary. And then God arranged for these four witnesses concerning this one who is the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so we may know the certainty of the witness to which, uh, to which they point. Yeah. Okay, questions about all of this? Yes. Question. Uh, are there any hints in the Quran why uh, Muhammad was chosen to be the prophet? I mean, uh, does the Quran explain uh, why it was him? Like, uh, among the old Arabs in that world, why? It, 
uh, Allah was a uh, choice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, choice. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. And that would be a good question to ask a Muslim theologian sometimes. The, the, Qur the Quran demonstrates amazement that God would have chosen this orphan boy. He's a poor orphan boy, a poor Arab orphan boy. And the surrounding nations considered the Arabs quite backwards, that he would have chosen him to be the final prophet, the seal of the prophets. So there's that amazement, a little bit like Mary and the Magnificat, you know, why would God have chosen me? You know, that kind of mystery about that, a mystery of grace, of surprise. The Quran carries some of that sense of surprise that this orphan boy would have been chosen. Yeah. I think Muhammad himself was astonished. Never quite got over it that a little orphan boy, you know, so poor, so lonely, so bereft, was exalted in this way. Yeah, very good question. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Yes. Does the Quran elaborate on what it means um, that Jesus is the good news? No. What does the Quran mean by that? No, no, no. But, but I say no. But on the other hand, the descriptions of the life of Jesus, I think, make that quite obvious in the Quran. I mean, he heals the sick, he raises the dead, um, he, um, he, is, um, he is very compassionate, very loving. Um, he is so righteous and holy that he is almost of no earthly, <laughs> you know? He sort of lives on the edges of society. Um, and I, I mentioned this morning how that within Islamic piety, you have hundreds if not thousands of hymns written about Jesus and poetry about him and so forth. But he, he, he loves his mother. Oh, he's the kind of boy that every, every mother wants to have. He just dotes on his, he just really honors his mother, he obeys her fully. So, forth. so he's a very, a very gentle, kindly kind of person. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, it's been a good day, and um, I think a very important day. Tomorrow, we're going to be exploring the Hijra and the cross, which goes right to the heart of the gospel and, and Islam. Uh, and if you heard me preach on Sunday, I, I touched, touched on some of that. So. Um, this day, today we wrapped up with looking at the Incarnation and Tanzil, the divergences between those understandings and how we can interpret who Jesus is to our Muslim friends, the good news that he really is. And uh, tomorrow then we'll, we'll, we'll explore the, um, the Hijra and the cross, which take us in rather different directions theologically. Yeah. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.